for your prompt attendance. And we're very pleased to bring you um, our subject today about bring, becoming a talent magnet through um, proactive sourcing. Today, apologies. Um, we are pleased to uh, welcome Bree Mason from uh, Telstra. So Bree's the Employment Brand Manager at Telstra. So welcome Bree. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to hearing the Telstra story today. Before we do get into that though, before I get all excited, um, I do want to go through a couple of housekeeping um, components for everybody. Um, participants online, you're actually in listen only mode. Uh, that does not mean though that you can't participate with uh, Bree and myself today. You'll notice over on the right hand side of your screen that uh, in the panel, just towards the bottom, there's a little component there in the sidebar that says uh, chat or questions. So if at any time you do have a question uh, that you would like to ask Bree, um, please don't hesitate, type it in there and we will do our best to get to as many of those as possible. Um, if we don't get to your question today though, um, please be assured that we will follow up post today's webinar uh, to actually get that answer back to you. We will be keeping to the time frame that we've actually been uh, allotted today. So the webinar itself will probably take about um, 50 minutes, 55 minutes at the most. We've got a lot to get through today which is a, a fantastic story to cover. Um, and just so you are very aware, um, within about uh, two working days you should receive a follow-up email from us um, thanking you for your attendance and uh, providing you with a link to take you through to the actual thing. So we'll, uh, we'll get moving into it then. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Um, please excuse us for two seconds. We just have a technical difficulty with our phone. I'll just be one moment. Uh, my apologies for that. So uh, let's uh, get into the Telstra story. So Bree, can you tell us a little bit about Telstra? I'm sure most people do know about you, but uh, I'm sure there's some uh, little bits and pieces you can share. Absolutely, Penny. Um, I often, yeah, feel as though whether I need to give, I guess, an introduction to Telstra um, because we have been part of Australian society for over a century. Um, we are Australia's leading telecommunications and information services company, uh, but there's so much more to Telstra than people actually realise. Um, I'm constantly blown away by the stories of how we impact lives of Australians every day. We have been on a long journey, um, one that has spanned over a century now, um, but we do keep evolving so we can connect Australians into the future. For us this means that we're really making um, some of the biggest changes in Australian corporate history. Um, it's about putting the customer at the heart of everything we do and innovating our technology, operations, brand and culture. We believe the more connected people are, the more opportunities they have. So our purpose is to create a brilliant connected future for everyone. Uh, what a lot of people don't realise is we actually have um, an international presence that spans 15 countries now. Wow. Yeah, and that's actually something that's um, of a key focus for us now, that international growth, a key part of our strategy moving forward. So I'm quite excited, excited to see where that's going to take us in the next few years. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. It's very exciting um, that global expansion, but also you know being part of such um, a dynamic organisation, 100 years young, um, yes. we should say <laughs> these days, um, and uh, such an iconic brand, um, and so many great challenges there. So it must make being at uh, working at Telstra an exciting place. Absolutely. Oh, I look, I'm, it might be important brand manager, but I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it makes uh, loving your job even that little bit more. <laughs> Okay, so well, let's talk about them being a, a, a talent magnet. So why would we actually do that? I'm just quickly going to run through a little bit of uh, research that we've done. Um, and uh, I'm sure these statistics uh, would resonate with you, Bree, but uh, we're saying that around 31% of employers are finding it difficult to fill talent shortages and that comes um, from manpower. Um, people like Towers, Watson and Aberdeen are all saying thanks. 65% of global companies have problems with finding uh, uh, employees with the skills that they actually need. And Burson, of course, uh, 
it's saying that you, you're competing in a, a battlefield. So this is why it's about being a, a talent magnet, um, shaped by the fact that the market has actually changed now. So it's no longer just uh, putting jobs out there on a job board or even you know go back further with newspapers yes, and, yes. and those <laughs> sorts of things. Um, the, you know, you've got a plethora of talent to be able to get to, but there's still those challenges in that. Um, so how does these, these sort of statistics resonate with you, Bree? Um, they don't surprise me at all and I actually thought that might be a little bit higher, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, in our experience, we don't have a shortage of applications. Yeah. We receive up to, say, 15,000 a month. Yeah. But for us, it's actually about attracting top talent and there's definitely a war for talent. Um, so we have our challenges in attracting those types of people um, and each organisation would have their own unique challenges, I'm sure. Um, but as we know, I guess this work of War for Talent is only going to get worse. Um, we'll be facing new challenges, um, some interesting trends, I guess, that will impact us all around the ageing population, yes. the rise of the individual and the contingent workforce, um, I guess social networks, yes. um, communities, um, changing the way we, we do things, especially in the recruitment space. Um, and the internet of everything. So, right. So that uh, that takes us to that um, a bit about uh, why you'd actually begin this journey with proactive sourcing. That I'm sure, and we're going to get a lot more detail into that moving forward. Um, just something else uh, that we found in uh, researching your subject was around the fact that uh, most organisations, and I know this is a little different for Telstra because of your actual research sourcing model that you have, um, but uh, the percentage of spend seems to be around things like agencies and such. But your professional networks and actually working with your people to help um, actually engage with the talent that's scarce, you know, that's scarce out there um, isn't that high. But when you actually see the job filled, it sort of almost turns on its head and says, well, actually the agencies probably only present you with about 8% of your field, um, but the professional networks are about 10%. Um, so I know it's a little bit different uh, for Telstra. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Difference? Yeah, look, it's, it's not radically different. Um, for us, definitely um, job boards are still making up a portion of our hires, uh, quite a, a significant one because of a lot of, I guess, the nature of the roles that we are filling the front house, your retail and contact centre style roles. Um, internal hires and candidates are much higher for us. We've actually been focused on that, um, that internal movement piece for us. Um, but for us, actually, probably in the last few years, a lot more of um, the spend has gone towards our employment brand and promoting it at a brand level. Um, and also our social media spend it would be um, higher than um, what's trending, what seems yeah. to be trending. Yep, beautiful. Mm. Well, well, let's have a look then at uh, the actual um, challenges for the participants on the line. So we're going to open up a poll, everybody, for you now. So this is a multi-choice poll. And that, uh, the choices you have there around shortages for talent for critical roles, organisational brand awareness is limited. So it might be that for certain roles within your organisation, you're just not known for those. Um, the competition for specific roles, so you actually might be competing in lots of different markets to actually attract talent for certain roles, so not you know, just your actual competitors. Um, and as we all are aware, um, that be where you need to uh, reduce um, cost or increase efficiencies and such. So it looks like everyone's uh, having fun hitting the buttons there and uh, selecting uh, potentially more than one. Uh, but we did have a question come through uh, just while we're waiting for those poll results. Um, so yeah, a great question too, I think, here in that uh, you are a big brand uh, in Telstra. So are you seeing a trend in a, a lack of skilled applicants coming through? Absolutely. The traditional channels, I suspect that's meaning, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, as we, as we all know in this industry, it's about um, active versus passive candidates and um, it's when, when unemployment's virtually non-existent <laughs> in Australia, we're doing quite well. Um, um, there's not a lot of those top talent, I guess, um, sitting on job boards and applying to our roles. So it's, it's really about um, needing to be more creative and, and I guess and strategic in our sourcing yeah. um, to make sure we are trying, really filling those roles um, with top quality candidates. Okay, yeah, so as you said, you got to, you get like 15,000 applicants yeah. a month, but yeah, are they the right, right ones yeah. for you? That's 
right. Exactly. So, all right. Well, we might close that poll off now and just have a look at um, where we're actually sitting there. So it looks like um, well, the, the shortage of uh, critical uh, roles is uh, number one there. Uh, then comes up that uh, the competition for the specific. Um, then we have uh, reduced cost. I uh, knew that was going to come up nice and high um, and then closely followed uh, there by the organisational brand awareness. So um, that's fantastic. Thank you everybody for your participation in that and I'm sure that uh, you'll actually get some tips and hints from Bree throughout today's webinar to help you in those areas. Um, so but just before we totally get into that story, um, We've actually found, um, and Burson's uh, got a big 60% here, which is around organisations that have found the need to actually look at their actual recruitment strategy um, due to the changing market, the talent shortages, the war for talent, as you were saying, Bree, and such. Uh, so it's, uh, we've actually then said that 25%, 27% are also then considering changing as well based on that. So. That's a lot of organisations going through a change process and this is quite a huge change process yes. to actually undertake. So let's get into it and uh, actually have a look at the Telstra journey. So the business challenges. So Bri, can you tell us a little bit about what really did drive you down this um, aisle no journey? Problem. Absolutely. As I briefly touched on, we have our challenges. People think, oh, it must be easy. If you've got the brand, you can attract mm -hmm. the talent. Um, that's definitely not the case. Um, a big one for us is really around the size and scale of our organisation. That in itself creates a lot of challenges for us in the recruitment, from a recruitment perspective. Um, the diversity of the jobs that we need to fill, um, and the, really the, the size and scope of that. Um, and the fact that we have people working in every corner of Australia um, and now in 15 countries around the world, yeah. <laughs> um, look, that's probably a big challenge. They always fact to create a big challenge for us. So in FY, 13, I haven't got the final stats for um, this next year yet, we had around um, over 37,000 full-time equivalent employees. Wow. Yeah, so we made, from a recruitment perspective, we made around 7,500 hires um, wow. right across Australia in, in that year. But that was for 2,670 different job types. Wow, yeah. So right. that's, yeah, as you said. Yeah. Um, and some of these jobs range from scientists to um, e-health specialists, um, from lawyers, journalists. It's a lot of roles that people, I guess, you wouldn't assume that we have at Telstra. Yes. Um, so that for us means that we need to invest our efforts in initiatives with great reach that work on a volume scale. Yes. Um, another big challenge that we face is really around the perceptions of Telstra as an employer. Yes. Now, Telstra obviously is such an iconic Australian brand, and with that brings the, I guess, an abundance of awareness but also the challenge that we're often boxed in by the legacy that the brand represents in people's minds. Yeah. <laughs> Being an ex-government utilities company that hasn't always put the customer at the heart of everything they do, um, you could imagine some of the impacts that could have on our employment brand. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> um, the perception of Telstra doesn't equal the reality. And um, so really, that's, I guess, my role at Telstra is to make um, or help the external employment market understand what Telstra is really like as a place to work. Um, it's been a big challenge and we have come a long way, which um, is quite exciting. Um, but the changing, I mean, the changing markets have impacted us um, and it will impact us much more in the future as we adapt and diversify um, our offerings. Um, so workforce planning and strategic workforce management is critical um, to our success now in terms of retaining that talent that we have. Yes. Um, but the employment market's changing too. So the needs of the employment market, their behaviours, and it really has shifted to being more of a candidate's market. So we really need to adapt our practices to meet those needs as well. Fantastic. So, uh, and I know that um, you then, based on all of these challenges and such, have set a goal for the careers team, um, and that's one of creating the 21st uh, century resourcing there. So uh, let's have a look at... Uh, how that actually works for you. So what does that actually mean? What is 21st century resourcing? No problems. Um, look, the, you've already you touched on this right at the start, Penny. The recruit, recruitment world is changing and the way we attract and recruit employees into our organisation has changed dramatically, uh, especially over the past decade. 
So gone are the days where all you had to do was put an ad in the EGN section of the newspaper in order to fill your critical roles. Um, skills are in short supply, candidates are smart, and the good ones don't need to look for a job. So instead of posting and praying, our recruiters are now turning to social recruiting and using tools like uh, LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook to source passive candidates, as well as the active ones that we're receiving as well through our more traditional channels. Employee referrals are now more important than ever. Um, and, I'm really, and I mentioned really that, that shift to that, I guess, that candidate market. So we need to be much more smarter when developing our sourcing strategies. So in order to ensure that we are remaining competitive as an organisation, um, we're really needing to take a huge leap and move recruitment out of its comfort zone um, because we're not able to rely on these active candidates anymore. And definitely, I think it's a big one we are very aware of that is the ageing population. And as of next year, it is going to get worse progressively. Yep. Um, so in order to build a workforce that's capable of delivering future growth, we need to shift from reactive recruitment processes through a proactive sourcing approach, ensuring we're hiring from the best in market, not just the best who are applying to our roles. Yeah. That means a shift in the skills required within our recruitment teams, um, as well as the tools that they need to do their jobs. It's about proactively reaching out to candidates or potential candidates, uh, about building these talent pools and communities, um, and keeping them warm and engaged with our brand and our employee value proposition. Um, and then we're able to, in a more traditional way, tap into these talent pools and communities when the hiring needs arise. Yeah. So it's a very different approach, and I love the picture we have here for you. Yeah. Where you've got that old world starting at attracts, and it doesn't mean that you don't still need to attract. As yep. you were saying, there's that um, you know sometimes the best talent is actually out there looking for a job. Something yep. happens, so you want Absolutely. to make sure you still connect with them. Um, but we just. Uh, have a look at what the transition actually does look like. And I love this slide as well, where you've really encapsulated what your challenge is. As you said, you get 15,000 um, applications every month. That wasn't your challenge. It was about who's actually coming to you. So can you take us a little bit through what this actually this slide's telling us? No problem. Really for us, it's about looking to that future state. And it's about finding and building relationships with qualified candidates we're at various stages of that job seeking um, life cycle or process. Um, so these more of the passive ones. Um, and it's about creating a pool of candidates that can be readily accessed when the hiring needs arise. So we have a team of sources who work on the hard to fill role with our recruiters. Um, but this, I guess when we call it more strategic sourcing, is about understanding and predicting what our future recruitment needs will be and reaching out to people in advance of those needs. Um, it's about understanding the market that we're competing for talent um, in and ensuring we're talking with the best people in those markets. <laughs> um, and it's about understanding what they're looking for, um, their fit for Telstra, um, with these communities that's then keeping them outdated and informed um, until that, that, that role um, comes up. Um, so as we can see, like it's, for us it made complete sense um, that it would be reducing the volume of applications we actually wouldn't need to be sourcing all of our or going to market for all of our open vacancies. Um, so it's really then a shift in the types of people that we're needing to, I guess, what, what are the people within our recruitment teams and what are the activities, activities they're doing that we know need to sort of shift to support that future state model. Beautiful. And I know we're going to go into more depth around all of these aspects moving forward, but I know that to kick your team off, you actually have a bit of a definition around what proactive sourcing means from Telstra. So, can you take us a bit through that? No problems. It's really around, um, for us, it's, I guess, passive candidates um, really is around people who aren't actively job seeking. Yep. So they're not applying to our open jobs. Um, for us, it's that, how do you build these relationships with people up front? Um, acknowledging that they are at a very different stage of the cycle as well and acknowledging their needs at that time yeah. um, and creating these pools that we can tap into, um, that we can work with our recruiters to be able to um, have these long lists ready to go uh, when that recruitment brief comes in. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So let's have a look then at what is your, um, your expectations of your proactive sourcing strategy. So what, what do you want to gain from this that's different? to that old world style. Yeah. Uh, for us, really, a, a big one, um, a big, I guess, 
sorry, focus um, at Telstra overall is about um, creating a better, an amazing customer experience. Um, so we need to understand that impact we have as a recruitment team on that customer experience. And when our candidates are actually also our customers, and you think about um, the impact that you can have as a, as a brand experience through someone spending hour, a couple, many hours even of um, completing our application or recruitment process to be rejected by an automatic email, um, isn't a great brand experience. Mm -hmm. So that's a big focus for us as well, looking at everything we do actually in our career centre. So for us, I guess, practice sourcing, it, well, if we don't allow these 15,000 applications to come in each month um, and people to go through that experience, that's ultimately going to be a better candidate experience. Yep. Um, but if we're able to um, bring people in with, I guess, less information or less work on their end yep. um, in order to come, in, come into our world um, to be considered for a job, um, I guess they have lower expectations as well. So. Um, that's a great benefit for us that we see, obviously. Um, the fewer applicants um, obviously means less workload. Um, it, it frees up our recruiters to be actually consulting with the business um, rather than having to filter through um, all of those candidates and provide every one of them an equal and, and fantastic experience as well. So you were saying that earlier about the fact that you've got to actually really understand the market and the way to understand your market is to talk to the people that work in it, yes, which yes. is the actual business. So you're yes. seeing that need and enabling that requirement for your recruiters to get into that space, which is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, a huge one is about decreasing the time to fill. <laughs> um, if we've got um, the best people already on these short lists that's going across to, the, um, to our hiring managers, well, hey, imagine even if our recruiter turned up to take the brief and because they have an understanding of what they might need, they've already got the best candidate in the market sitting there, and he, um, that, that, that's an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, and can definitely um, speed up that process. So when you talk customer, it's just it's about the end customer being, you know, someone on using a telephone, mobile phone, yeah. any, you know, your broadband network or whatever. It's actually your hiring managers as well getting a great experience. Absolutely. Um, an increase in talent pool, a higher amount of talent pool is important because we know that. Um, that means it's going to impact our key KPIs in the recruitment space, so time to fill candidate quality, because the people we, in, we know are in there are qualified. Um, these are really good candidates, so um, that's an important measure for us. Um, there's a quick and easy conversion. Um, if we've already had these conversations, we've already been to the process of qualifying whether they're a Telstra fit or not, uh, we know that when we can reach out to them when opportunity arises, that should be a faster process. Um, and it really, for us, and in my space, is really important. It, it opens the door to significantly more creative, modern, and effective marketing campaigns. So if you think about the investment you might put into promoting a job or a, a project and a number of vacancies, um, you could buy a whole heap of media, drive people back to a, a job on your career site. If that job isn't suitable, um, they might not apply to it once they've actually read the detail. Um, so. I think for us, it's looking for ways in which we can capture these leads and all these people that we are talking to proactively in, in a way um, and getting better return on investment really from all those efforts. Fantastic. Okay, so it's really um, great to see you setting these, job, um, these goals, um, you're changing processes to adapt to the proactive sourcing approach. Um, however, I'm sure there's a lot more to it than just that, I'm sure. So um, let's explore some of those other aspects as well. Um, so we've got here for everyone to have a look at, and I know this is quite a busy slide, everybody, but uh, Bree's going to talk us a little bit through here. Um, this is about your employment brand, and uh, you, you said it earlier that uh, uh, your iconic brand has been around for um, 100 plus years, um, so people have a perception of your yes, brand. Yes. Um, and I know this has been a, a huge journey for Telstra um, to, to change that. And this is obviously having an impact on your employment brand as well. So can you take us through a little bit what, what you've been doing there? No problem. Um, and employment branding is really quite close to my heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's really important for organisations to define what their employee value proposition is um, and the messages they're going to take to market to differentiate themselves as an employer. Um, and that's in each of the markets that they're recruiting and competing for talent um, in as well. Yeah. We've spent quite some time in designing this at Telstra. Um, and actually just completed a, a refresh of our EVP, which was uh, a large project, but a really exciting one. And we, yeah, I'm really excited with, with the outcome, and I'm looking forward to launching that um, internally as well as externally in the coming months. 
Um, I think it's really important as well to, I guess, design an employment brand. So obviously, every company has an employment brand because it's what people think feel uh, think feel about you as a company, as an employer. Uh, but often that's a perceived it's a perception <laughs> as opposed to a reality. So I think it's, it's very important for us to, to be de developing an employment brand, um, which is really the personality and look and feel that we apply to our EVP messages in order to bring it to life and take it to market to reach and resonate with the parts of people we're trying to attract. Um, why is this, I guess, so important to this conversation today about strategic sourcing? Um, I think it's, it's all about making sure you've got a consistent and really good reason for people to want to even um, enter that conversation with you if you have yeah. a source that proactively reaching out to, um, to a candidate. So it's what these are the messages that uh, your sources will be using when they're doing their sales pitch to mm -hmm. these, um, these people who we've approached. Um, once they're in our communities, it's the messages that we'll consistently be using in all the content that we're sharing with them, the events we might invite them to. Um, it's also the information that goes onto our careers website, um, the, the information but also the look and feel and how um, people can get a good understanding of what Telstra would be like as a, as a place to work. This here is actually um, it's our employment brand strategy at a very high level. Yeah. Um, Imagine there's a lot that sits behind <laughs> that. <so. laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, really. I guess for us, it's by leveraging our workforce, we're communicating our EVP through the stories and images of our own people, and we refer to them as our employee ambassadors. So we have an official program and representatives that span right across our organisation. Um, our people share how their career at Telstra connects them with what they love. Um, we select ambassadors that model like our, our values, the capabilities, and the behaviours that we expect of our people. Uh, internally, that helps our people understand what good looks like and what they can, I guess, aspire to, to become. Or, um, but then, I guess, externally, we use them really um, to tell their story, to be providing evidence to the claims we're making and, and proof that Telstra really is a great place to work, rather than Telstra trying to tell the world. Um, because we do a lot of advertising, so yeah. how do we cut through and, and how to make it believable? Um, so, yeah. And I know that um, you've got. Uh, quite a high employee engagement um, score. Um, so the, obviously the ambassador program is a great way to actually say, you know what, this is a different place. This isn't about um, you know, the, the grey cardigans type yes. people that uh, uh, are out there or you know, the guys up the poles and things like that that are putting their lives at risk when they're up there as well and such. But it's about finding those people that actually say this is the type of place, the real place that we actually work and that your brand actually represents it as well. And now we've got a little snippet here of um, uh, one of the uh, activities that you do with your ambassadors, which is fantastic that uh, you've been able to, your people are so connected with your brand Absolutely. that they go, yep, I'm, I'm okay to be an ambassador, I, I'll put my, my name, my face <laughs> yes, yes. out there and say that I love working at Telstra and that must be really... Um, pleasing, you must get real proud when people actually accept those opportunities. Absolutely, it's a, it's an amazing world. I mean, I actually get exposed um, constantly to, pe to people across right across our organisation, and they're so willing to share their story. Um, and it's it's funny actually because a lot externally people believe that they um, they'd be embarrassed to work at Telstra. <laughs> it's that little barbecue conversation. Yep. Um, but there is Telstra's workforce is filled with so many passionate, um, highly engaged, really Telstra proud people. So this really taps into that. Um, we do have uh, over about 100 official ambassadors that are right across our organisation. Um, they're used for their, um, in a my simplistic sense, their, their photograph and their story uh, is used across every single execution or communication um, for our employment brand. Um, so you'll see it, our careers website is, is our home at the centre of our uh, digital universe. Yes. Um, and their, their stories are right across that. Um, they really do bring it to life. Um, but any job ad you'd see on any job board, it would actually leave with one of our ambassadors and, and their story. Uh, they represent us at, at events, um, people like myself speaking on webinars. So it's really getting out there telling our story. Uh, social media is a very big one for us as well. Um, this is actually a snapshot of, of our careers blog, uh, which we publish um, at least one a week. And that's written by our people. Um, so we really tap into their passions, their excitement, whether it's sharing a day in the life of, or something really exciting that they're working on, or even their vision for what their future is at Telstra. Um, 
it's, it's a great way for our people to share their stories. So you've actually tapped into and extended your recruitment team Absolutely. by over 100 people by having these ambassadors, which is fantastic. Absolutely. Um, so you ensure that your brand represents you. You have your current employees on board. So then how do you then connect them with that passive candidate? So let's have a look at that journey. Um, we really looked at well, what what is candidate relationship management? Um, well, what is this? Um, what is this? You know, we to that, the, the new world and these new um, things that we need to be considering as part of recruitment. Um, and we broke that down into three, I guess, three step process um, mm -hmm. in what in candidate relationship management is at Telstra. And for us, it's about attract, engage, and convert. Um, with these three pillars, with I guess we've designed our strategy around. This, this concept. Um, we've mapped the aims for each stage of that process. We've identified the tools, the technology, the processes, the people that we need for each of those stages as well. Fantastic. Okay, so let's have a look a little bit into each one of those. So an example of a tract for you. Absolutely. So here's really, um, I guess, just some ways in which we go about attracting people to consider a career at Telstra. It's really important to have a fully integrated brand campaign to support all of the efforts of your strategic sourcing team. So it would be very hard for them to go out to candidates proactively um, if, if candidates weren't already touched in another way of that with our message. So this really, by doing all these things as well, it supports the efforts of, of our proactive team. What I've learned in the time is that there's, there's no one best channel for employment marketing campaigns. So people utilise a number of different um, channels or ways of, um, to make a decision about what a company would be like to work at. Um, so it's important to find the mediums that your target audience are using and find ways in which you can then reach your target audience and influence them. Great. So you'd yeah. be using a mix of these, so not everything all of the time. <laughs> But depending on the role that you're actually looking to apply out for, um, you'd apply one, two, three or more yeah. of each of these. But then there's some consistency in how you're actually doing that as a, from a brand perspective. Absolutely. So there's, there are, we have our brand marketing strategy, which is that always on. It's what's Telstra like as an employer um, overall. Uh, and then we have our more specific campaigns that would be uh, to try to fill a vacancy or a maybe a new store opening or a whole new part of our organisation that we've built. Yep. <laughs> it's happening quite a lot lately and um, we're having to move into completely new markets where we've never had to compete with talent before. Now we're moving into e-health, we're talking doctors and nurses and yeah. that's a whole, wow. a whole new world for us. Um, so there is, I guess there are two, two approaches we have, um, approach we take. Um, I think for us as well, I mean, social media is a key part to our, um, to our story. And it's something we've concentrated on quite heavily in the past, I'd say, two, probably two and a half. It's been around, we've been using social for about four to five years now. Right. But in the last two years, we've started to really invest heavily into it, um, concentrating on how we can harness social for that employment brand promotion I referred to, but also as a sourcing tool for our team. Yeah, so we've, we've really we've defined our objectives for social. We have designed um, a digital and a content strategy. We've built solid platforms across. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter uh, and Facebook. Um, we also have our YouTube channel uh, as well as the blogs I referred to. We've got a team of people who help manage that community wow. and also the tools to monitor um, for analytics um, and response as well. Um, You've made a huge investment in that yeah. space and I suspect though you, when you look at um, the uh, other statistics, I don't have them right in front of me, but we know that how many mobile phones there are around the world and how many um, tablets, I have to say that rather than just the iPhone or the Galaxy or whatever, but yeah. people are just so socially connected now through their um, Facebook networks and uh, Twitter and all of those sorts of things. So you, you've really invested in connecting with that. Yeah. All right, so let's see how you then engage them. So um, happy to actually uh, have all of these magnificent strategies to get out there and attract them. How do you then engage? So you've got a, a bit of a model here that you work with. Yes, yeah. So this is um, really for us, well, to be honest, um, the on good, ongoing development of content is actually a very challenging and time-consuming task. Um, and obviously our social media function has been resourced short. I'm sure in, in 
most organisations, they don't even have a, a social media team. Yeah. Um, but it, it's one person who's doing a lot of different things for us. Um, but, so we found it hard to devote, I guess, that time to research and write updates. And this is just from a social sense, which is what we, how we're communicating with our, I guess, these um, communities proactively okay, now. Yeah. Um, we are lucky enough to have um, someone looking after that. And, but we, I guess from that, we have seen a significant increase in the engagement levels as a direct result. Um, so now, as I was mentioning, it is a core part of how we go to market today. So um, we tried it out and it has worked for us. So I think we'll continue to invest in in the future. Um, from a social perspective, what we found useful was to create a weekly content calendar and planning like, content in advance. Yep. Um, and making sure the content had a lot of variety. Um, it was a mix of different types of content, um, but also um, I guess not so not just in content, in in topic, but also in the um, its type. So whether there's a mix of photos or stories, um, it's a video, it's a promotion, etc. Um, what was really important we found <laughs> was to not get sidetracked and publish irrelevant content just for the sake of needing to push something out that day. Um, so we we needed to be really clear on our messaging strategy. And um, what we we did was pull together this. Um, was our conversation messaging strategy, <laughs> yep. what we refer to this diagram as. Um, and we make sure that it, it stays true to this, and that split of, I guess, um, what the types of content going out. Um, this way we know it's going to resonate with our target audience and we're going to get a good ROI from the efforts we're putting into that. So this is the approach we take to all of our engagement communications. Um, and it's also, we're going to use this when we're producing our CRM comm strategy as well. So you're thinking about how we can apply this, this thinking and theory to our email, email newsletters that are going out to the talent pools, um, whether it's the conversation that the strategic forces are having as well, um, and even how we bring this to life um, in, I guess, real life interactive forums as well. So how can we create that experience uh, for people too? Oh, fantastic. Mm. So a lot of energy and effort going into ensuring that um, you don't waste all of the energy and effort you're putting into reaching out and attracting people, yes. um, then um, using um, different forms to actually keep people engaged in the process and such. Now this must have meant quite a shift for your people as well. So let's have a bit of a look at um, your, the role of a proactive sourcer. So because it's yes. probably not every recruiter in your team, I'm sure. No, no. Um, this is, I guess, really for us then the the. Um, this is the convert piece, so that transition from a lead and this community we've been building to actually um, into the recruitment process to get some value from all that work. Right. Um, and that, that process is really brought to life by our people. So having the right people with the right capabilities in the sourcing function um, is very, very important. We have had a sourcing team for over two years now. Right. Um, and that's really been though a transition from a, what was it at the time, was a more of a candidate management um, function and right. team. Um, to now moving to that strategic sourcing function. Um, we've definitely seen some, um, we've seen some successes over the years, otherwise we wouldn't have continued in this direction. Um, but we've also had some failures as well, and, and we've learned from that, which is why now we're in a, a process of um, a state of redesign and rebuild for our, what we refer to as our talent acquisition function. Um, so some of the things that we're considering as part of that redesign is really, um, what is it that that role needs to do? So clearly defining the outcomes required of a strategic sourcer. Um, for us, as well, what is it that they're working on? Um, we've, we've, we've played around with that for a while now and, and what we've learnt, when they focus on a, a few smaller amount of roles, um, they're able to get some, I guess, see some great benefit from that. But in the last uh, year or so, we've probably shifted to seeing a lot, much more broader. So we're, I think, struggling to have a great impact in any one area because we're spread quite thin across. Um, it's also, sorry, I was going to say, that, that goes back to before you were saying about you've got to understand your market, got to know your people um, and have an opportunity to enable your recruiters um, or your, now your talent acquisition specialist uh, to be able to specialise and be able to move into those spaces. So, and it's really be impactful um, and get that return on investment. Absolutely. We've also been focused on what the role shouldn't do. Um, and, right. and that's something we've learned. There's been ups and downs over the years as well. So um, they're not a recruitment admin function. 
and I think that's what a trap we've been caught in because of the history of where the function came from. Um, that's, I think, that's some of the perception, um, that's some of the tasks that get picked up. Um, what's the role of, I guess, what's the mix of both that proactive sourcing but also reactive? So what is the role of recruiter versus sourcer is something we've had some great conversations about. So is it working on, um, I guess, active roles and, and um, alongside with a recruiter and, and they're out, the recruiter looks after the candidates coming in, the source is out there looking at, well, who else is in the market? Do we have the best people? Um, so that's definitely something we're, we're, we're still refining. Um, but then what's that mix of time spent on these proactive building of talent pools um, is something we're still working through. Uh, the capabilities required to undertake these roles. So um, that's something we've been trying to identify as well. Um, it's for us as a result, what's the positioning of the sourcing function? And it's interesting. I've we've done some research looking at different organisations to see where they've how they've positioned their function. A lot of companies it is it is more of that junior role. So um, it's I guess a pipeline into recruitment, um, and they're doing a bit more of the administrative style task. Um, but then a lot of, couple of organisations that we've, we've met with um, who are doing it really well, they actually position the sourcer as actually more senior than the recruiter, so uh, quite controversial. Um, but really they're the, these deep industry experts that know the market inside and out and they're well connected with that market. So it's working through where that best fits within your organisation with your, with your recruitment model. Um, and then also that, I guess, that process of transitioning from a current team um, in, into this new world that we're designing, we know I mean, it's not going to be easy. And we've been working on this for a while now, so understanding what training and upskilling is required for the people we actually have in the team today who are doing a fantastic job. Because obviously we're shifting the expectations as well, so how can we support them in that? Um, what's the team structure? And this is something that's still, once again, controversial internally yeah. as well. Where do the sources sit? Is it, are they a, a team of sources that work together? Or actually, are they working within the recruitment team, um, and then they're just a virtual team? And once again, as I just mentioned, the process we're going through, we're looking at what what's going to work best. Um, we've looked to what I think the challenges we've had in the past, and are now looking to adopt um, I guess strategies that will help us overcome them, um, and hopefully be more successful, even more successful function. Um, but then as well, um, what are the KPIs and expectations of a sourcer, and how do we track the effectiveness as well? I think in the part we haven't had the tools to be able to understand what they're doing day in, day out. So let's see our recruitment teams have their dashboards, um, they have their activities, it's, it's there. And so how can we support our um, sources in understanding how effective they're being as well? So as well as the processes and everything else, it's, it's a big piece um, we're working through. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm hearing here is that um, TELS has really adopted this learning organisation model. Let's give it a try, we'll test here, we'll do some research, um, but we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we're learning from what we've done in the past, learning from our peers, um, how they there in other networks and such, and actually then going, how are we going to define that, and, and change as you go yeah, as well. Because um, it is a journey, this isn't just a bang, let's, yes. let's go with this. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, as I understand it, you're then also looking at your technology to take you on yes. that journey as well. To, Key part, yeah. Challenges. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, great. You can have great people, but if you don't have the processes and the technology to support them or the tools to do their job, they'll have challenges. And that's where we've had some challenges in the past. Um, we're now getting our tools and our solutions sorted. So it's obviously the people aspect that we're kind of refining now as well. Okay. So exciting times. So, what about the results then? So, um, some great statistics here. When you shared these with me. Um, I got very excited. And the, what, there's a couple here that just blew me away because we all know LinkedIn's great. So if I look over on the right-hand side, you have 85% LinkedIn. Yeah, that, that helps. But Twitter and Facebook, look at the types of results that you're actually getting from what would not be considered traditional, even traditional social recruiting um, spaces. So um, the fact that yeah, you're now up to 95% direct fill roles. Um, you know, you've reduced your time to fill by 7%. These are fantastic results and you're attributing a lot of these to your proactive sourcing strategy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, definitely measuring the impact and ROI of employment marketing and the online efforts, but also strategic sourcing 
is definitely not easy and um, we haven't nailed it 100% either, for sure. Um, but we're really excited about um, this additional CRM functionality we'll have available to us, which is really going to give us some additional data and insights that we haven't had. I'm really excited for it to change my world. <laughs> Um, I guess the challenge is that a lot of the data sources aren't integrated. So um, your social data isn't integrated with your website analytics, which is not then integrated into, into PageUp. And then our, when we look to our, our source reports and our, um, all our application data. So it's very hard for us to measure the exact, I guess, impact um, we've had on the hires and the cost of hire um, throughout all of these um, different issues that we've, I guess, and strategies we've put in place. So I guess over the past couple of years, the things that we, the sort of things we have had available to us that we have looked to to understand how effective we're being. Um, and this I do, this is old, older data now, as I mentioned before, we're still just finalising this, this financial year's um, results. But we have shifted from, um, it was back in 2008, where 100% of our recruitment was outsourced to agency. So now we are at that 95, it's actually a little bit higher than that um, now, that, um, of our roles that are filled directly through our careers centre. Mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a place for agency still for yeah. us, and that's definitely to assist us in that in that next growth phase when we are moving into new markets. Um, we've been able to reduce that time to fill, which is great. But there's still we've um, got a lot more to do as well, and we're um, really looking at how we can get that down further. Visits to our careers website has gone through the roof. Um, we get around 150 odd thousand visitors each month. Um, wow. So yeah, that's, and that conversions to those num large number of applications. But the important ones as well for us is around, well, how many are we hiring um, from the talent pool? Because that's where we can really understand how effective our sourcing function is, is being. Yeah. Um, social is fantastic. Um, and for us, it's understanding that conversion though, from yes, we have all these followers that we're talking to, the engagement rates we've got for our social function are um, actually what much higher than the industry based practice. Um, it's how do we understand how we convert that across um, is something we're excited to, to, to invest, look, in, look into further. But Facebook and Twitter have been um, definitely um, interesting sources <laughs> for us. Yep. Um, obviously with our, the graduate and a lot of our front of house roles, the contact centre um, and retail, it's, it's been a very effective way to engage with these communities. Uh, but then also a lot of ones you don't expect as well, when are different, very different and corporate functions have had great success. If you've got an amazing researcher or a sourcer, they're tapping into any insights they can get and they can learn a lot about a person through that, that, that social profile they have. So um, definitely there's a lot of opportunity there within Facebook. I'm looking forward to seeing um, your 17% increase with uh, your new commitment to the proactive sourcing space. Um, I've been given the penny some time, keep moving young lady. So <laughs> what I'm actually going to do is kick off a, a poll now and uh, just get everybody, you've had a lot of information today I'm sure yeah. and uh, we have had questions coming at us um, massively. Um, and uh, I'm going to go through a couple of those now and we'll try to get some more at the end. But uh, we're going to kick the poll off and that poll is to ask when you might actually start that journey. So um, first question for you, Bree, is uh, where does the role of the talent sourcer fit within the recruitment function and what are their specific responsibilities? Now I know you did touch on this yeah. slightly, but it's just a little bit more detail, quite quick and succinct. <laughs> yep. Um, well, currently, well, Currently, our sourcing function is a standalone yeah. our talent acquisition team. Um, we are looking at that, whether that's the right model for us in the future. We had challenges in around how um, they were partnering with the recruitment team uh, and being seen as separate. So we are looking at how we can um, evolve that and, and build that relationship, um, bringing I guess, things together and being more effective. Um, the responsibility and kind of really look. It's, I don't know if time to talk about it today, but it, it is really about their role. It's about um, the recruiter looks after the candidates coming in. We also need to look at the role that the recruiter plays in, in practice sourcing as well um, yeah. because um, we don't have enough sources and I'm sure most teams, if they're lucky to have one or two, they can't be spread across every single job that comes in. Um, we are looking to move to maybe today's specialised uh, sources, look at um, maybe the, the top, whether it's the highest volume roles that we get coming through or is it hard to fill. And that's something which we're uh, playing around with at the moment. Um, yeah. So it sounds like a combination though, yeah. making sure that there's synergy between the, in the whole process, um, actually sourcing them to actually recruiting them. Fantastic. 
And just another real quick one before I close the poll off, which is um, it's quite interesting. Uh, it says, how successful have you been in attracting um, female applicants? So I suppose this is about diversity. Is yes. that, has being proactive helped you in that space? Yes, um, quite a topical one. Um, yes. We've also done a lot of work, not only in um, how we're um, proactively reaching out to female talent, because uh, it's obviously something that we can control, um, yes. um, but also looking at our employment brands and how attractive that is to women. Um, so we actually did do a study a couple of years back to define our value proposition um, and a women's employment brand and have been um, investing in, in communicating that to the female audience. Um, quite excited actually as part of the study we've just done to understand the external perception of Telstra. Um, as an employer we have had a big shift and um, the female workforce is have definitely increased. The, the number of people who would consider working for us has definitely been, has been a big increase, which I'm very excited about. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and we are hitting our gender targets. So um, there's definitely, we're not well, blowing them out of the water, but look how it, it, that's the reality of the industry. With, there's a shortage of female talent, or even females, in a lot of these areas we're working, we're looking in, in technology and IT in the field. So, yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, close that poll off then and uh, the results we've got there. So it looks like a lot of you have actually commenced the journey, which is fantastic. So hopefully there's been some uh, tips and such uh, from today to continue to help you on that. And a few of you are going to be approaching it uh, in the near future. All right, so let's just uh, close that off and uh, we'll look at what might be some of the considerations that uh, the people on the line might actually take uh, forward from today from you, Bree, um, if they're on this journey or if they're just entering into this journey. Because I'm very resonant and we're down to the last five minutes or so and I'd like to try and get a couple more questions in. Um, so the considerations? Absolutely. Um, look, it's, it's definitely we've referred to spoken about already, but it's not as simple or straightforward transition into a proactive world. Um, it's taken a Years. Um, and there's still a lot more work to be done, which I've spoken about as well. But some of the things we are considering in this process are around um, really that the support for the team, um, and that's obviously the recruitment team, it's the sourcing team as well, um, and how we're really implementing this new model, um, which definitely um, is a low consideration into that. Um, integration in the current workflow. So obviously we have a recruitment process. So how does this um, tack on to the start of it and and flow in a, in a um, very straightforward and efficient way. Yeah. Um, so the workflow, I guess, within the CRM that we've obviously been working very closely with Page on implementing is obviously there's the tool, but how do we have that um, design the processes that support our needs around the technology, but then also work with them to yeah look at um, how we transition. Um, bring someone in as a lead, take them through that whole engagement, that, that journey I spoke about, and then how do we even transition them into recruitment as well? So that's a lot of things that we've been um, designing um, some robust processes around. Change management, very important. Um, yeah, this is key task. to that. Task. Yep. And continue. Hearts and minds. There's a lot we need to consider as part of that process. Um, but we have been very clear that this is the strategy and, and the direction we've been um, wanting to take. It hasn't changed. And we have been talking about actually implementing um, a CRM as a tool that we needed to support this journey um, and that was two years ago. So right. we, it's consistent and we're still heading that same direction. So um, but really that change management piece is a big one. Um, that support, so looking at um, that, that team we're creating, if they, are, if, they, if they do sit with recruiters, where is that strategic? Um, Where's that leadership and that insight and knowledge coming in from if, if there isn't a, a head saucer or if you want to refer right. to it? Yep. Um, so where does that, where do we keep getting this best practice coming in? Um, where's that coming from? Um, looking at our sourcing strategy. So yes, what marketing do we need to do, but what is the best mix of channels that we need to be using still? Understanding that proactive is just one, um, one small part of that. Um, that the best mix of channels to ensure we're getting the best people on our short list. Um, and how are we going about managing these leads? So we're going to be building these great big talent pools and communities of people who are quite interested in hearing from us. We actually now need to communicate with them and, and that's a big piece of work. Um, so whether that's um, through regular communications, email communications, uh, whether that's actual phone calls that our, um, our sources are making, 
um, how can we get the business involved in this as well, ultimately? Right. So yeah. bringing them into the, um, take some accountability of keeping these candidates um, warm, coffee catch-ups, which is a networking event. So there's a number of things we need to design um, to suit this new world, which is very much outside of the traditional recruitment scope. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, Gabri, we are nearly right on time, but um, I did want to sneak in a couple of questions. Um, so the uh, first one is, uh, um, you say you do proactive, uh, you do proactive sourcing. Um, does that mean you don't go out to market e with job ads of any kind? No, we absolutely go to market um, through all our traditional channels as well. And I actually just kind of touched on that is making sure yeah. we've got the right mix of channels because um, we know it, it, we need people who are looking for a role who can actually start as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, that process to convert someone from um, that proactive process, it, it is slower. Um, so uh, we definitely are, and that's I mentioned, some of our, our hires are still coming, a lot of our hires coming from job boards. And that's just the reality of the workforce that we're trying to attract. So having a mix of um, all those channels to make sure we have, have those best in market um, on our short list. Definitely there is a lot of space for our job boards. Yes. Okay, and I'm going to squeeze one last one in here. Um, and look, please, everybody um, on the line, there have been a mass of questions come through today for Bree. <laughs> um, so we will be working with Bree post today. Uh, to get back to you um, by your account executive or a, a contact that you have with us here at PageUp uh, to answer uh, your questions. We will make sure that you are not left in the lurch, but um, we'll go through this last one. Um, was this your inspirational EVP or what people were actually saying was your EVP um, were employees and candidates? Is it what they were actually telling you? Yeah. 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 Great um, question. Yeah. And it's like, um, I was actually only having a conversation yesterday about um, with one of our head of our legal um, team. Yeah. Um, so we've done a lot of work um, internally to understand what is most important to our people in a career, um, and also what are the things that they enjoy most about that work experience at Telstra. So what is it that's keeping them there, getting them out of bed, um, putting that discretionary effort that we're, that we're asking of them. Um, so we've we actually have um, a very large portion of our workforce. Um, represented in this research. Great. We've uncovered a number of different drivers that, um, that really drive both attraction and retention. Um, so we've funneled that down to what are the ones that are going to be um, most effective for us. Um, and look, the reality is a, a marketing base, it's a value proposition. It, it, it's marketing and mm -hmm. there will always be an element of aspiration to it uh, because we know not every single person will enjoy that same employment experience. Um, we can have the policies, the processes, the culture, the environment to, to enable them to have that, but it's, it's down to the individual, um, their stage in their career, what's going on in their life, and whether that's actually a reality for them. So yes, it's, there's an element of aspiration because of that, but these are the things that our people have told us are both important to them and yes, that we are delivering on um, with this portion. So um, it's now down to our leaders um, in making sure that they're committed to continually creating this environment um, or this culture that's, that's affording everyone that opportunity to experience that. Fantastic. Well, look, we are right on time. So, um, Bree, uh, finally, just a massive thank you. Um, you have been, uh, and Telstra as, as well, um, you've shared a lot of IPs with uh, us and your uh, audience today. So thank you very much for that. Just a quick reiteration, everybody, that um, yes, we apologise we didn't get through all of those questions. Um, hopefully some of them were actually answered by the content as we were going through. We did notice that some of that was actually happening, um, but we will get back to you. Um, final reminder that, that we have recorded today's um, session, so within about two working days uh, you will receive a follow-up. Thank you for attending email, um, giving you a link back out uh, to the actual recording. So thank you all again and have a great rest of the day.